Well, George, for our gardeners who are out there viewing us from across the state, many of them don't know what sorghum is. Can you tell us something about it? Oh, I sure can try. Uh, sorghum's a tropical grass. It's uh, related to corn. It's one of uh, several kinds of sorghum. There's milo. Uh, Johnson grass is actually a sorghum, too. What distinguishes uh, sorgo, which uh, is the sweet sorghum, from uh, the other sorghums is the amount of sugar that it carries in the stem. Something like Milo would have about 2 to 3 percent. This has uh, up to uh, 20 percent sugar That's in the quite stock. Quite a difference then. Mm -hmm. um, now, how does this compare with sugar cane? It's going down well, Louisiana. Sugar cane is really a totally different kind of crop. Uh, it's cultured differently, and it's much, it's much more sensitive to the cold. We could not be growing sugar cane up here, at least not economically. Mm -hmm. And sorghum is a crop that fits into this area and really grows quite far north. We have some sorghum producers um, up into Wisconsin and into Minnesota. Really, that far north? Mm -hmm. uh, now, sorghum is grown for sugar cane. I guess, um, are, there, are there different varieties of it that grow better here versus up north? Uh, yes, the varieties do vary quite a bit. And we're still trying to determine what would work best in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Now, there are a lot of old varieties around. I mean, sorghum has a history in this part of the world that goes quite a ways back. You'll find a lot of producers in the hills. There's a lot of sorghum mills still around. And most of these people are growing what we'll call the old varieties, varieties like uh, sugar drip, honey drip, seeded ribbon cane. And they will make good syrups. But there have been a lot of varieties developed in the last few decades that we're beginning to look at now. Um, this particular variety here is M81E. Uh, there's a variety called Dale, Brandies, Tice. A lot of these really haven't been tested well in this part of the world, and we are just beginning to do that now. So that's part of what you're doing here at the Curse Center. That's right. That's great. Well, um, how do we grow sorghum here? Is, is it a warm season? Uh, you said it's a tropical grass. Obviously, it's a warm season crop. Give us a picture of, of how you grow it here in Poto. Okay, we would be planting our sorghum pretty much on the same schedule that we would with, uh, with Milo. Mm -hmm. uh, or a late planting of uh, corn or sweet corn. And it'll mature through the season, and depending on the variety that you have, harvest might begin as early as late August and continue up through frost if you have a late variety. After frost, the uh, harvest is over. Okay, because it is a warm season grass. Right. Well, now, how do we harvest this? Well, um, you're holding a sickle there. The first year that uh, we harvested our cane, we hand cut our cane. But, a whole uh, acre? A whole acre. That's, that's how much we had that year. Uh, we've modernized, if you want to call it that. Uh, uh -huh. When you see the machinery that we're using, I don't know that you'd call it modernized. <laughs> but um, I I'll probably ought to explain. We use a little different method than probably a lot of people that are familiar with the old methods of harvesting sorghum mm -hmm. uh, would know about. Typically in the past, people would go through their fields and, if you'll hold that a second, and using a paddle, usually a wooden paddle, something like a sword, they'd strip the leaves mm -hmm. from the cane. And then they'd go through and they would hand cut or use equipment like I'll show you and then remove the heads from the cane. Mm -hmm. And this stripped stalk, then stripped and headed stalk, would be suitable to go to the mill. Now, we're working with methods that eliminate the need for stripping the leaves. We still have to head the cane, remove the seed head. But um, I'll explain when we go back and we look at our mill and our cooking building, how we handle that cane differently to avoid the process of stripping. Because when you get into uh, commercial level production uh, for the small farm, and we are still looking at the small and intermediate scale farm, if those folks had to go out and hand strip acres of cane, it would just make You'd production of syrup, cut. well, it would be uneconomical. Sure, really. yeah. You mentioned that you've got um, a little bit of automation for it now. Can we take a look at that? We sure can. Okay.
Well, George, you said you were mechanized. What on earth is this? Well, one thing about uh, sorghum production, when you're working in the scale that uh, we're talking about, it's kind of a matter of farming with antiques. Oh, I see. <laughs> now, believe me, this is quite a step up from uh, using the hand sickle or the machete. It's uh, actually, it's an old row binder. And uh, these have been used for harvesting corn, for harvesting different kinds of sorghum for years. And, and I can't even tell you the exact age on this machine, but it must predate World War II at some point in time. And it was originally meant for being horse-drawn. For being horse-drawn, absolutely. Okay. You can see the driver set here. This large wheel here uh, drives the mechanism. It's ground-driven, mm -hmm. you know, works exactly with ground speed. These are the gathering chains which carry the cane up. There's a cutting bar down there. It's cut, put into small bundles here, where when it gets to a bundle about that size, it's automatically tied. And the tying mechanism is a little bit like a Rube Goldberg machine. I see. But, you know, and it works about as often as but that, too. That's where we get the term binder twine. Though. Right. I see. Right. There's a whole bale of it back there. Well, great. Well, and then this little carrier collects several bundles and by pressing on uh, this little pedal here, it'll carry them off to the side. Well, that's handy. And then after you're through, uh, after it gets a load and carries them off to the side, um, do you have to haul them out of the field by hand? Mm-hmm. Now, now we found, and, and they have found by research in uh, some of the states in the south, that there's a lot of value to leaving that cane lay in the field um, up to seven or ten days, if, if the weather will allow you to do that. Mm -hmm. and, with the rains in the fall, you often can't leave it that long. But that's part of what we do to allow us not to strip. That process of drying the leaves down on the cane and the enzymatic changes that occur in the stalk um, are advantageous to giving us a higher quality syrup when we actually get to milling and cooking. So it gives you better quality by letting it lay in the field for a little while. Well. Um, now that it's gathered up, where do we go from there? We go back over to the mill. Okay, well I understand Jim's going to help you make some of that syrup. Oh, well we'll see. We'll okay. see how good a cook he is. Okay. <laughs> George, how do you tell when to harvest the sorghum? Well, Jim, the old timers used to tell by looking at the seed head. Mm -hmm. Now this is a bit green. I just pulled this for a sample, but they would generally look at a seed head and determine whether it was, is in what the agronomists would call a late dough stage or an early ripe stage. That's usually about the ideal time to begin harvest. But uh, we use a little bit more modern approach these days by using a refractometer like they use in the wine and juice industry. We put a sample of uh, milled juice in here. We take a sample from the field to mm -hmm. test that and see what the percent sugar is. And you're looking for a minimum percent sugar? Right, a minimum of about 14%. And we prefer to see 16 to 18%. In some areas, they get up to 20% by the time they're milling. So you'll just monitor the fields, and once it gets up to that level, then you'll go into harvest. Exactly. And they come into bundles, they're dried, and you bring them up here. What's the next step? The next step is going to the milling process itself. And basically, what that involves is taking these bundles from the field to the mill. At the mill, we uh, cut the strings on the bundles and feed handfuls into our mill, probably about this big around, a double handful. Now, our mill is kind of an interesting animal all in itself. I can see that. Right, it's another one of those antiques that we farm with. And this particular mill is a 1906 model. We purchased that in eastern Tennessee, in the beautiful town of Strawberry Plains. And, uh, it's still quite an efficient model. You'll find that uh, most farmers, most of the smaller farmers, are using mills that uh, go back to the early sugar industry and the early sorghum industry because nobody is commercially making mills anymore. Now this squeezes the juice out and it collects down in the bottom here? Right, it's basically just a crushing process. Uh, we, we have three rollers in this mill. Most mills are three roller mills. The first rollers are spaced, oh, about three-eighths inch apart. The last one's about a sixteenth of an inch. And all that does is crush the juice out of the stem. 
which then flows through a little filter. We have a burlap filter on the end. And the juice then flows downhill to our milling building, going first into our settling tanks. As the acetylene tanks are really a very key point to this operation. As I mentioned, because we don't strip the leaves off of our cane before milling, there are additional things that we have to do to get a quality product. And by putting our juice into settling tanks and allowing the juice to settle out for approximately two hours or more, we remove a lot of the impurities and that which we would get by milling cane with the leaves on. How do you get the clear juice out of the settling tank? We decant the juice off the top of the tank and really discard the bottom two inches of the tank. And it's that bottom two inches that contain all the impurities. Now, do you, do you squeeze the sap, the juice, as you're cooking, or do you squeeze ahead? Because of the two-hour settling time, we have to do quite a bit of milling in advance. Now, to assist us in this, one of our holding tanks is a refrigerated unit. And we have to hold that juice at 45 degrees or lower in order to hold it overnight. So we do a good portion of our milling the day before we actually cook. And then some additional milling starting early that morning so that we have a pretty efficient cooking run. So your first sap that you're boiling is from the day before and then as you get through with that and you start using that mornings. Exactly, exactly. Now another thing that we do to help assure quality we use a small amount of natural enzyme, it's called amylase, which, um, I mean, this particular amylase is synthesized like vitamin C can be synthesized. But it functions very much like it does in the human body. It breaks starch down to sugar. And this prevents our final product from gelling. I imagine if there's starch in there, it would be just like putting cornstarch in, in a liquid to make gravy. After you cook it, it, it would right. thicken up. Right. So you need, need to break that down into the sugars. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And we use a very minute amount and shortly after we begin cooking, it's completely destroyed and disappears from the process. Okay. Now how much of this, the squeezed juice do you need to uh, make a gallon of, of syrup? It will vary, vary quite a bit depending on the percentage of sugar in the juice. And we're normally evaporating about six up to about 10 gallons of water for each gallon of syrup we produce. Our evaporator pan is 16 foot long with uh, baffles in it so that the um, juice is flowing back and forth from the juice end of the pan where it enters up until the finished end. And as that juice moves along there, it gradually becomes denser and denser until it reaches the stage where it's a syrup. How do you heat the, the pan? We have a propane burner. Now, traditionally, uh, a wood fire was used. And there are still a lot of folks that use wood burners. Uh, what a lot of the upscale operations are using now is steam. And that's really kind of a preferred method these days. Now, that, that blower torch down there, your heater, how far does that throw a flame underneath there? It really throws it about two-thirds the length of the pan, with the heat continuing all the way to the end and out the chimney. So you've got quite a bit of flame and heat following the whole length of the pan. If you were to look underneath, you'd see a sloped clay hill, which breaks off right at the end of the pan so we don't scorch the syrup. Now, how long, do, how long does it take from getting the sap in the beginning to taking it off? And how do you determine when to take it off? It's hard to say because our process really isn't done in such a way that you can easily measure that. But it would take us approximately, oh, a six to eight hour day to cook roughly 300 gallons of syrup and have it bottled and be cleaned up again for the next day. We sort of measure our process in, in those terms. How do you determine when the syrup is ready? We determine that basically the same way we determine when the juice is ready or when the stock is ready to be milled. And that's by using a refractometer that's in a bit higher range of readings. We're trying to make a syrup that is 78% sugar, 78 to 
And while we're processing, we take samples of that syrup to make sure that we are taking off a syrup of that density. Now, one of the interesting things that people find a little hard to understand is that we can determine what temperature the syrup should be at when we take it off to give us that percentage. So we have a little thermometer stuck down into our syrup pan that tells us what the temperature of that syrup is right at the end. And we use that as our guideline for taking off the syrup. I should point out that through this entire process, we're continually skimming the surface of the juice while it's cooking. It's during that process, a lot of impurities rise to the surface, and these have to be removed again to get the clear kind of product that we want. Now, at the point in time where syrup reaches the consistency we want and we're removing it from the pan, it's roughly 230 degrees, which is quite hot and a little bit too hot to immediately bottle. So we run that syrup over a cooling tray, which reduces the temperature to roughly 160 degrees on the average. Now, how do you cool the syrup on that cooling tray? Well, this particular cooling tray is designed for water cooling, but since the rate that we take our syrup off is generally so slow, we're just allowing it to air cool most of the time until we happen to get a fast, heavy run. And then immediately after that, we put it into our bottling tanks, and we try to bottle the syrup at a temperature of at least 140 degrees. That allows us to reduce potential spoilage in the syrup, and also gives us a vacuum seal, which is uh, much preferred if you're taking it to the supermarket or someplace like that. Now, but how do you, how do you store it? I mean, you vacuum sealed it. Uh, do you need to keep it cool? We recommend to people to refrigerate after opening. That's on our label. However, if you're using the syrup at a relatively rapid rate, uh, you can store it just like honey. It's you know, quite similar in nature. Of course, if you're going to use just a small amount and leave it sit for about six months, it's better off refrigerating. Now, I've heard people talk about sorghum syrup and sorghum molasses. Are they different? Basically, they are the same. Now, technically, the term molasses does apply to the byproduct from sugar manufacturing. And sorghum syrup is a primary product. It's direct, the direct evaporation of sorghum juice. So it is properly a syrup. But it's the same manner as people calling blueberries huckleberries. It's incorrect, but it's just in common usage. Right. It's, so we call it molasses, too, when we're talking to those those folks that would prefer to hear that. Now what, okay, what do you, I mean, it's sweet, it tastes good. What do you use sorghum syrup for? Probably the most common usage in this part of the world is simply heated and poured over biscuits for breakfast. But sorghum can be used very much like honey or just straight sugar. There is a conversion that you can find in most recipe books. And it can be used in baking, um, barbecue recipes, a whole range of different uh, cooking uses that you would be using any other sweetener for.